Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are we doing? So, uh, welcome. This is the design track. So, if you ain't interested in design, you can leave right now. <laughs> the doors are locked, so you're not going anywhere. Okay, uh, my name is Jo Crossley Anderson. I'm marketing manager for The Moment. Uh, the Moment is really super proud to be sponsoring the design track today. If you haven't heard about us before, we're a film, digital, and immersive agency. Um, we've got about 80 people up in Estover with our creative studio up there, and we're actually part of a wider communications group called the Creative Engagement Group. Um, so unfortunately, this isn't about me, because I could talk for days about what I do and what my company does, but I get straight into, where, oh, there you are, our first speaker of the morning, who is Tom French, who is from the moment, and he's a digital planner, and he's going to carry on a little bit from where um, Ruby left off this morning. So a big clap. The IT stuff is working. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming, for coming to the design track. Um, I'm going to start with a mild confession. Um, I didn't know the titles of any of the other speakers, so I didn't know what the keynote was about, which is, was also about my topic. And I didn't know that the next person was doing laser beams. So I probably would have thought something different if I'd known that. Um, I'll introduce myself because I need to set my stall out a little bit before I do my talk. So I'm Tom French. Uh, I'm a digital planner. I work for the moment. I spent my entire career thinking about how we can design different platforms to get people to do certain things. So whether or not your employees or your delegates that are going to an event, I work to make sure that what my business that I'm working for wants to do gets that message across. Now, I'm not a vegan, um, I read The Guardian, got to say all these things first because my topic is a little bit ethical and about what we should and shouldn't be doing. Um, I don't actually know the answers to any of the stuff that I'm about to raise. And really what I wanted to do was give you all maybe kind of something to think about as you go through the rest of the day and you start to think about what you're doing in all of your jobs as well. So in our kind of crazy world full of different controversies and all of the terrible things that are happening, probably one of the quietest ones is around how different people who, are, who were originally very proud members of founders of particular companies like Facebook, for example, have all started to come out and say quite derogatory things about those companies. Um, the big one for me, and the one that I'm going to touch on the most, really, which is about behaviour and how people have created things to make particular behaviours happen, is Facebook, when they started from the very beginning, looked at how they could exploit weaknesses in us as people. So they looked at what made up our kind of material makeup and said, I need to exploit that because I need to make money off the back of it. Now, it's kind of a not really considered thing if you watch all the film series and stuff like that. It's actually about how they were a couple of dorm room people who created a social network. It's in their original investor pitch that they were going to base advertising off the back of it. They were going to sell what we were doing to advertisers. So what I kind of want to start with is what is our responsibility as creatives when it comes to behavior design or when we're creating things where we want people to do something that may be consciously or subconsciously they're not aware of. What we are basically doing is creating habits. Um, is that a good thing? Again, like I said, I don't know all the answers to this. But when you think of habits and you don't think of technology, you generally think of lots of negative things. So smoking and drinking and gambling, and lots of things that have societally negative impacts on our lives, for people and for communities. In technology, we actually celebrated the fact that we can create habits. We wrote books about it that went on to sell millions, and most of you, or some of you, have probably got somewhere a copy of how you can trick people, or you can create things to make people habitually take part in your products. Is that good? Should we be doing that? If the smoking industry was to say, oh, we've got this new way that we can really get people addicted to cigarettes, we'd all be in moral uproar. But we pressed on and went, yes, we know how we can hook people. We created things like faking update loads. So when you go onto Twitter or Instagram, for example, and it says it's updating, that's just a trick. It's a, it's a psychological effect that they put in on purpose. There's no reason for that to actually have to take that long. So we did that because we want to kind of create this idea of you're going to get a reward. And it all stems from this horrible dirty tactic of variable rewards. When we started to look at how we can create habits, everybody looked back onto an original study that was done by Skinner, which was performed on rats. 
What he did is he put lots of rats in a box and he gave them one lever. What he got them to do was pull the lever every time they wanted food. After a while, the rats kind of fell into a routine and they would basically pull the lever when they were hungry. <coughs> so when they consciously decided, I, I need some food, I'll pull the lever and I'll get one piece of food. What they did was they changed the amount of food that the rats were going to get every time they pulled the lever. And the rats very quickly broke out of their routine and began to pull the lever as often as they could, all of the time. So that the food that they were getting was going to be maybe two lots of food, or three lots of food, or ten lots of food. And the rats kind of no longer only pulled the lever when they were hungry. They would pull the lever all the time because the dopamine release that they were getting was basically enough to make them constantly want to do it, whether they were hungry or not. What we have done is we've taken that study on rats and we have gone, we can do that to humans. So every time that you open your phone now, for example, and you've got a notification, you have a different variable reward, or it doesn't have to be social media, I will say that this is not a social media bashing. Um, this is all things whether it's games or different platforms, employee engagement techniques, what we do is we introduce this idea of variable rewards every time you return. So we create addicts. We create addicts all the time. I'm not going to compare technology to smoking or drinking, but what I wanted to do was kind of show the audience sizes that we are responsible for compared to some of those ones that are much more heavily regulated and kind of much more frowned upon. So Facebook users in the UK, 16.2 million, something like that, taken in an account for kind of fake accounts. There's only 9.4 million smokers. So straight away from a UK-based audience, we have an impact much higher than those of smokers, and that's just Facebook. So if you take all the people that are doing everything on the internet in the UK, the audience is much greater. 34,000 units of beer a second are consumed in the UK. That's an awful lot a second. Um, <laughs> But there's 3.3 million Facebook posts globally. So our intended audience, again, is consuming and doing things much more often than these other industries. Is that good or is that bad? Again, I still didn't know the answer. But do we have a responsibility to start to think about the impact of the things we create on the lives of the people that are doing them? There's a crazy amount of studies, and there's only 20 minutes, so I haven't got time to go into all the kind of negative impacts, and if that is a negative impact of technology. But people have huge increases of depression, which is relative to the amount that they use technology. Again, there's probably a million variable factors that suggest it could be other things. But there is a balance, because what we also do is we create things using the same techniques, the same variable rewards, the same kind of tactics, to create positive habits in people. Uh, Pinterest, for example, built into their very core values is that they actually want people to engage on the platform but then go and do something in real life. So they want them to leave the platform and go and do something else. Strava, they push you notifications, they tell you what all your friends are doing, they rope you into this community, but the idea is that you get healthier, which is good. So when we're creating things, do we have a responsibility to look at them and say, is what I'm creating, does it have a positive value at its core? Is that the line? Do we start to draw it out? okay, we can use variable rewards as long as what we believe in is actually having a positive community for everybody that's going to be involved? I think there's three aspects to creative responsibility. That's educate, promote, and empower. And I'm going to go through each of them as to kind of maybe the different questions that we can ask when we're considering our responsibilities within this area. Do we have a responsibility to design solutions or create solutions that are going to be positive for our communities <coughs> and our environments? Do we or do we not? I don't know. If somebody comes to you and says, I'm going to give you £2 million to design this app, is it the responsibility of the person who's paying you to do it? Or is it your responsibility <coughs> if the person's going to go and tell them Okay, I can get this many on board by doing this, and I can make sure you get retention by doing this. Do we have to educate the people that are going to use our products better about why we're doing particular things? So let's take Infinite Scroll as a, an example, right? That was completely designed because it increased engagement time. There was no major real benefits, you know, in any other way, but it was, I'm going to keep scrolling, I'll keep scrolling, I'll keep scrolling. We've all sat next to our partners or our friends, whoever it is, and you try to have a conversation with them endlessly for hours. And that's just infinite scroll. That little technique created that I can just keep going forever. Should we give 
are kind of users an opportunity to turn them off, go back to the other way if they want to. If we explain to them that the reason we've done this is because we're going to keep hold of you for longer. Do you actually want that anymore? Do you not? <coughs> Protect. Um, obviously the keynote talked on this about just being a pinch of salt and not, um, <laughs> not necessarily coming in with lots of regulations. But every other addictive industry in the world has regulations and compliances they have to align with. And this is ultimately to protect the people that are consuming their product. So if you go into a bookies, and you're a regular in a bookies, and you're on a watch list, you can't pay. If I'm a barman in a pub, I'm about to apply for my license, and I've been given a license, if you're too drunk, I can't serve you. We don't have any of those sorts of moral lines that are drawn up by law. But as creatives, do we have a responsibility to protect the people that ultimately we want to engage with our product? And kind of finally, should we always start to think about our products as empowerment tools? Should we always try to make sure that what we're doing actually empowers end users instead of hooks them, instead of creates habits for them? Do we want to create tools that don't unconsciously, and I'm not saying that everybody is evil and that we all go out and we create these tools to kind of rope people in and capture them, but should we make sure that Yes, we get our message across, but we don't permanently affect the life of that person in any other way whilst we're doing that. Is it our responsibility to make sure our product doesn't damage that person? Of course, there's ethical and there's moral reasons as to why we should do this. That's, you know, those sorts of questions need to be answered. But I also think there's a, as an industry, we need to protect ourselves. The more kind of enlightened we do become about technology, we, as a group, are probably more, much more aware than our friends and family about how the internet works. And that's enlightenment for me. You need to understand what's being done to you. So we need to protect this industry because the more enlightened people are becoming, the more they're starting to think of technology and the creative industries as harmful to society. Recent study completed 27% of Americans believe that technology is more harmful than good. Over a quarter of people in America think that technology is not good for society. Now, if you want to kind of make that as an extreme <coughs> argument, you could go all the way to the end and go, once you get to a certain tipping point, people will give up on technology. They won't use it, they won't get involved with it, and all of the collaborative and beneficial things that we've seen in the past 10 to 20 years could start to be undone. So do we have a responsibility of creatives to make sure that our industry is represented properly and is represented morally? This is a long quote, but if you are interested in ethics and, and around creative and what we can do, because I think that it's not going to happen from Silicon Valley. It's going to happen from people like us, because Silicon Valley is so embedded in this business model of they need eyeballs, that all their KPIs are based on engagement. It's always based on how many people are consuming our products. <coughs> so people kind of outside of that ripple effect can start to make much more conscious decisions about what we're doing. But Tristan Harris, his story, for example, is he um, founded a startup, Google bought him out, he was a product manager for that startup, and what he was in Google kind of thought, this is not right. Everything we're doing is just not right. It's, it's ethically wrong. So when he went to leave Google, they actually said to him, why don't you become our design ethicist? And you can go around and you can talk to all of our product managers to make sure that they're making the right decisions for the product and the user. And he's got some fascinating insight into how Silicon Valley and psychology and all that works. But how, as kind of individuals, can we start to look at our own work and go, is this right? I think it's a simple question of, um, am I creating something that allows people to make free choice? Or am I creating someone, something that's going to give someone the illusion of free choice? So for me, as someone who writes user journeys all the time, I am consciously always trying to make people go down a particular route. Should I start to think of, well, at what point can they get out of this? What point can they come out of this loop that I'm always creating for them? And it really is just about freedom. Is it an illusion or is it real? So, like I said, I don't have any answers really. Just kind of was talking for 15 minutes. But um, what should we start to think when we're looking at our own work? Firstly, what I'd like <coughs> everyone to try and do really is go, in this unregulated industry, do I have a responsibility for the impact I have on someone else's life? And have I ever thought about the impact I'm having on someone else's life when I create my products? 
Um, and finally, should we be putting the interest of KPIs around engagement and user growth second to the impact that's going to have on communities? Should actually a hit in revenue, if you're engagement based, or a potential loss from an investor because you don't get that user growth, come behind the fact that actually you're doing things in the right way, you're not tricking people or making people kind of habitually reliant on your product?